Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. We're going to see how the new iPhone works out. <laughs> what I've done is um, looking at different cameras and different things, and still the iPhone is the best uh, for uploading on all these platforms and filming. So what I did for the ministry was I went out and got a second iPhone. So I have two phones. One is going to stay directly here in the office, the brand new one, this one. Hopefully everything works and it uploads. And that is going to be the ministry iPhone. It will have a different phone number than my own. I don't often give my number out. A few people do have it. But I am keeping the old cell phone number and the old cell phone. It's got a lot of life in it. It's paid for. And I think I'm going to go forward for the time being, at least for the next year or two, with two phones, one being the brand new one here that I can use in the studio for uploading and filming, and the other one for my personal use. So uh, I'm going to see how that works. I always try new angles on new things, and speaking of that, um, as we begin, let me make one announcement. I'm hoping all this films and comes out all right. Um, I received an email from one of our congregation members the other day. Actually, I received a couple of emails one of them was that there was an issue with PayPal, and currently it's been my best option for receiving donations online uh, from, uh, than, from people. So every time I hear about a credit card platform, I try to investigate it and look at it, but within a short period of time, I find it's not much better uh, than PayPal. So I'm open for any suggestions for any credit card platforms. Um, I know every once in a while there's a glitch, and I think many of these platforms have glitches or problems from time to time, and I don't want to keep jumping around with plat different platforms, so um, give me suggestions. Tell me what I can look into, but every one I've looked into, just like PayPal, occasionally has some problems. So snail mail is fine with me. <laughs> Old-fashioned snail mail is still wonderful. It's a wonderful concept. I have about four or five people who use the P.O. Box. The P.O. Box regularly. I don't mind. I go to the P.O. Box. I got to drive past it once or twice a week anyway. I go past the main post office and my, use my P.O. Box. That's fine. Any support is always appreciated. I'm sorry if there's problems occasionally. This happens in the day and age in the computers we live in. Any support is always appreciated. And I'm a grace-based ministry. Therefore, I survive on whatever God the Holy Spirit motivates you folks to offer. I have folks, be honest with you, that send $25 a month. Some people send occasionally uh, a gift in. Other people do $25 a month. Other people do $150 a month. It doesn't matter. Um, anything is helpful because I'm very grateful for it all, and I go forward. Now, I have probably at least four people out of the 35 that are extremely, extremely generous on this ministry. And if not, we wouldn't probably go forward. So you better keep each other in prayer is what I'm telling you. But I'm very grateful. I will look into other credit card platforms. But anything we do online, folks, anything, has an element of computer glitches and, unfortunately, criminal activity. No matter what, which I've been a victim of more than once. In fact, about four months ago, on a good credit card platform with a company I've occasionally bought vitamins from in the past, my bank alerted me that it, it recovered the money, but somebody was trying to take out extra money that I hadn't approved. So, you know, it happens. My bank alerted me. I recovered it. But we got to be vigilant with these things we do online, credit card activity and banking online. Stay on top of it. So um, I apologize if anybody had any problems. It's the first one I've heard of in a long time. But uh, I do my best to try to investigate new things. Right now I'm using a new... Uh, camera iPhone specifically for this office and this ministry. So that's a whole separate bill I'm taking care of um, and going forward trying to make it easier and smoother for the ministry. So keep that in prayer. Let's jump into it. I do have two other a uh, couple of folks I want to keep in prayer. Shelby and Jason. I got news, good news about Jason and Shelby. Both are in recovery. Now I, I know they have a long road ahead of them. But both Shelby and Jason, we've been we've been praying for in recovery, and we have a new um, a new woman who's been following the ministry. I think her name's Michelle. I could be mistaken. Uh, from Michigan, her son needs prayer. I think he's going into surgery soon this coming week, 
So her son needs prayer, and she would like some prayer as well. I think she has some personal struggles going on. Hopefully, I've got that all right. Let's get us rocking and rolling now. Um, and I'm even going to look into a new setup, how I do the office. So we're going to, these things take time uh, I'm by myself doing this. So hang with me and bear with me. Keep me in prayer. I'll keep you in prayer. Our lesson today is number 53. First Thessalonians, number 53. Today's date is 2 19 19th of February, year of our Lord, 2023. Your title is, Your Royal Priesthood Enables Effective Prayer. Your Royal Priesthood Enables Effective Prayer. Let's get ready to jump into it. I think I've tried to announce all I can announce. Let's get ready to do the most important thing we do which is get in the word, be filled with the spirit. And we are going to open today in Ephesians chapter three. If you want to go to Ephesians chapter three, we are going to open there, but let's get ready to do the most important thing we do. Get in the word because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Let us prepare to take in the word of God. In doing so, let us read what the Apostle John said in, in, for believers in opening up that filling power, that Christ-like nature, filling power of the Spirit. First John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John 1, 9. Believers, all of us, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer right now. Ensure your fellowship is in order. You're filled with the Spirit. Get ready to do the most important thing we do. Study the Word of God and have fellowship with the Word. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're just asking you to lift up and bless these people that are recovering through our prayers. We know, Father, you listen to positive believers' prayers. And in your plan, we have people recovering from things. They're going through rehab. They're going through recovery. Father, please keep your hand on these situations. And Father, I'm just asking you to bless this little congregation. I believe in my heart it may be more powerful than what we even realize every day that we come together and study. Father, I'm asking for your hand on anybody that struggled with the, the support of the ministry or any problems going on that are connected to the ministry. Father, let them have clarity and go forward. And Father, any of the lies of the media, the wars going on, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the different things happening across the world that need our attention, need our prayer, let us discern what is true and what is not and what we need to support and what we need to stand and, and stand against, Father. Give us that discernment. Lead us forward, guide us in the word, and let us be a little, small, powerful congregation of believers that go forward as leaders in our circle of family and friends, our communities, through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Your royal priesthood enables effective prayer is your title. Open in Ephesians chapter 3. Hopefully, the new camera, the new filming, the new uploading, everything is going to go good. I'm doing the best I can to keep the ministry moving forward. Every time I see something I can invest in or do to make it better, I will do so. We are going to be hopefully, here's another thing hopefully happening with God's hand on it. Um, I got through, I have about 12 hours of angel teaching, which means there's about um, 12 different piles of notes. And I am on pile number eight or nine, sorting that through right now and putting the book together. So we're getting... To the last half of me putting together the angel book. My hope and my prayer is that in the next two to three weeks, I have a rough draft of the angel book done. I can hand it off to the two gentlemen who want to help me edit it. And from that point, it can start to rapidly eventually go to a publisher, which I have to look into as well and find out who I can get to publish a bunch of copies and get them out to you. So you have an angel book, and after that, when I get a reprieve, I'm going to put together 
my Titus notes from the South Dakota conference to do a leadership book on Titus. So I am busy. Keep me in prayer. And if there's any problems on the website or, or mailing something in or using the credit card platform, let me know. I'll try to look into it, but I know occasionally we all run into problems. I do apologize. It's not a perfect system. Um, I am a one-man ministry, one-man show. Uh, with your support, I'll keep going forward, but sometimes I get a little overwhelmed and I can't address all the problems. So I'm going to keep you in prayer and I will look into everything. What I want to accomplish today is to close out the doctrine of prayer. Either today or next message, wherever God the Holy Spirit leads me, it could go longer, but I am highlighting the deeper principles inside the doctrine of prayer that all believers need to fully digest. So I'm trying to look at the key ones of the doctrine of prayer. There's some certain scriptures that we have to look at and certain key principles that I'm trying to make them the emphasis. In relation to our current study of 1 Thessalonians, these are very pertinent prayer principles, I believe, we've been covering, and that's why I'm trying to focus on them and get them encapsulated in this little series. Prayer approach for the royal priesthood is our topic today. Your prayer approach from your royal priesthood is our topic today. So look what the Apostle Paul taught concerning prayer, Ephesians 3.14. And the Apostle Paul understood and taught believers have a priesthood. Believers do because of who? We are in union with Christ, the high priest. Ephesians 3.14. Pick it up there today. Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, Paul writes, I bend my knees before the Father. What's he talking about? A spirit, an attitude, an outlook of prayer. I bend my knees before the Father. All prayer is addressed first and foremost to God the Father. Matthew 6.9. 1 Peter 1.17. I think I've touched on these as a reminder all prayer is addressed to the Father. Matthew 6, 9, 1 Peter 1, 17 tells us the same thing. The mechanics and protocol of prayer is a serious matter for a Christian with several years of Bible doctrine under their belt. Maturity means better prayer. Bottom line. Capacity, maturity, they all go together means a stronger prayer life. Look, listen, I'm not taking credit for anybody recovering. You shouldn't take credit, but by the same token, because it's God at work, by the same token, our little ministry, maybe along with some other positive believers outside of our ministry, prayed for certain people, and those people are on the recovery faster than we thought they would be. That's what it looks like. Obviously, it's God's power working through us. But our prayers, our petitions for others matter. The mechanics and protocol of prayer is a serious matter for a Christian with several years of Bible doctrine under their belt. God expects us to have a doctrinal IQ. Do you have a doctrinal IQ? Do you have what I've told you in recent months, a library being built inside of you? Many pulpits do not really press their congregation to grow. A lot of pulpits don't. A lot of teachers don't. It's sad. A lot of denominations and big churches even don't push their congregation to grow. They're more concerned with, and this is a sad statement, but it's true. They're more concerned with keeping butts in the seats and keeping a full offering basket. Academic honesty should be the expectation you have for your pastor. Academic honesty should be the expectation you have for your pastor and all your church leadership in general. To be academically honest about what they're doing and the word. To be open and transparent with how they run their ministry. And also how they live and walk in the word. What they're teaching you is accurate. You cannot grow in God's grace and knowledge if you are not under a good pastor teacher. You will struggle. I'm just telling you. Many pulpits, many churches, many denominations don't care about spiritual growth. That's not their emphasis. They're more concerned with keeping butts in the seats... Making people feel good when they leave. There's a high, so they'll come back. And keeping the offering basket full. Sad but true. Academic honesty should be the expectation you have for your pastor, teacher, and church leaders. You cannot grow in God's grace and knowledge if you're not under the right teaching, period. If it's not me, find the right one. 
If you don't feel, if you've been with me three or four months and you don't feel any more your doctrinal IQ and things aren't becoming more clear to you and your library of doctrine inside of you isn't opening up and growing more, then find somebody who can give it to you. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. But don't accept the fluff and the nonsense and the emotion as doctrinal teaching. Please don't do that. It's a sugar high. Ephesians 3.15 For whom? Because of the Father, we bend our knee. We, when we go to prayer, when we speak, we speak to the Father. Verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We are all God's creation. That's why when you see an unbeliever, even if they're, they're causing strife or they're causing some type of division, just think in the back of your mind, that's God's creation. That's one of God's created children. They're rejecting what God wants to do unfortunately, but in the back of our mind, we have to keep that compassion alive. We're all God's creation. Once we've accepted his precious son, Jesus Christ as Savior, we are then entered into a royal family. God wants all of us, the lost and dying world, to come to him. But you have to come through Christ, God's divine justice system. Along with many other titles of privileges, we have the royal family, royal priesthood, and that all begins at salvation. All begins at salvation. Ephesians 3.16 And that we would, he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through what? His spirit. His spirit in the inner self. We can do nothing inside the plan of God without the filling power of God the Holy Spirit and the guidance of God the Holy Spirit. It's very important because it's very clear, abundantly clear, that during the tribulation, God the Holy Spirit pulls back. When the rapture of the church happens, all of the positive believers, all believers go up in the rapture. The tribulation period starts out with all unbelievers on the first day. I think that'll change rapidly. But there's a power of God the Holy Spirit that's restraining certain things about the fallen angels and Satan that he steps back and that opens up. That opens up, folks. We can do nothing inside the plan of God without the filling power and guidance from God the Holy Spirit. There is a supernatural spirit, God the Holy Spirit, working in and around your life, whether you choose to believe it or not. I look at something like Shelby and Jason recently, and I see the work. Amen? Our fellowship, prayer life, and new nature are dependent on the filling power of God, the Holy Spirit. Our fellowship, prayer life, new nature, growth, all of these things are dependent on the filling power of God, the Holy Spirit. How often are you using the filling power of the Holy Spirit? Is it habitual in your life? Ephesians 3.17 then goes on to say, the Apostle Paul writes, so that you go to the Father through the power of the Spirit, verse 17, so that you see the steps? In your priesthood, the protocol, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. You're going to the Father, but you're using the power of the Spirit, so Christ may dwell in your hearts. That Christ-like nature begins to open up through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, agape, agapao, godly love, not emotional nonsense. That's what he's saying. All of what the Apostle Paul points out, has to do with what you are building in your soul structure. What you are building in your soul structure. None of this is based in emotional waves, as I say, or human effort. None of this, I'm going to show you, is based in emotional waves or human effort. In your priesthood, as you mature, you realize there's a protocol, there's things you need to do. Proper thing, right thing done in the right way. You do not approach the Father until you are filled with, by the Spirit, wash that feet clean, like Jesus did at the Last Supper. I remember when Peter said, well, then bathe me, Lord, all over. And he said, Peter, I don't need to bathe you. You've already had salvation. You're already cleansed in your position, but your daily condition, your feet touching the world, old sin nature, need to be washed habitually. You do not approach the Father until you are filled by the Spirit, ensuring your Christ-like nature is present. 
This is a nice example in Ephesians chapter 3. We pray to the Father in our new nature, and by the name or the merits of Jesus Christ, we seal the prayer. By the name and merits of Jesus Christ, we seal the prayer. That's how we end our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Christ's name, amen. Your priesthood is an office of intellect, not emotional nonsense. Cheers. Sometimes when you get into this where you have to kind of teach where you almost sound like you're reprimanding people about emotional fluff, if they've come from a background where they've gotten a lot of emotion from the pulpit or they, they kind of thrive on the filling power of the Spirit is an emotional thing, that's their mentality. They don't like to hear about their intellect and building a library in their soul structure and going forward in knowledge. But you have to. Your priesthood is an office of intellect. You have to recognize it at some point in your walk and start to grow up. Your priesthood is an office of intellect, not emotional nonsense. In Ephesians 3.17, he's telling us, Apostle Paul is listing some things that if you just glazed over them and didn't pay attention, you might not take them serious and you would stay in your emotions. Heart, cardia, many of you know this, is your soul. It's not the blood heart pumping in there. That's not what it's used in scripture. It's talking your soul, which is what? Has to do with your mind. You have a right and a left lobe in your mind. You have to be able to gather and filter and go back and forth between the two lobes and then digest it. The seat of your knowledge, it's another definition for cardia. The seat of your knowledge deep inside, the depth of thoughts, emotions, and ideologies. Your soul structure, what's being built in there. Faith, pistis, many of you know this, but a lot of people, believers, walk, they think they walk in blind faith. I don't know where they get that from. Faith, pistis, is a conviction. If you have a conviction about something, it means nobody can shake you. Conviction of what you stand for. Faith is not blind. Don't, be bought, don't buy that lie. Don't listen to that lie. It has a target. Real faith is conviction. It has a target. The foundation of your beliefs. A foundation, what are you building your foundation in? Sand, putty, silly putty, or cement? Cardia points to our soul, the heart, the mind, or the place where we gather thoughts and knowledge. Are you gathering thoughts and knowledge, or are you having a sugar high on emotions? Pistis, faith, is not simply blind faith. Never think that, never agree. When somebody says that, you can kindly correct them. You don't have to get into a fight but say, I don't have blind faith. faith. Real faith has a target. Jesus Christ, I know he was here. I know he walked in that earthly ministry. I know he went to the cross. I know that tomb was empty. And then I know he walked around for 40 days teaching mystery doctrine and deeper principles and thousands of people saw him and he ascended and sat, the session sat down at the right hand, mission complete. I know. That's my target. It's not blind faith. Then what is he, what the Apostle Paul writes? Rooted. Rizzo, Rizzo. To be rooted of strong foundation. Actually, both of these words, rooted and grounded in the Greek, speak to foundation, but they speak to it on a level of powerful structure. Not some little kid building a sandcastle and the foundation, when the waves hit it, fall apart. This is talking about strength, powerful structure. Thelemato is the other one. Thelemato. Grounded, foundation, or powerful structure. Both of these talk about strength and structure and power and foundation. Ephesians 3.17, the Apostle Paul uses terms related to strength in character. Listen, somebody that's like, oh, I'll be with you wherever, I'm happy, everything's going good, I'm going to be your buddy forever. That's kind of what you call a fair weather friend. If it's emotions. Strength of character means when you start looking like a loser and all things fail and fall around you, you look and that one friend that has real strength and foundation of character, you look and they've got your back and say, you failed, but I'm still here. I got you. That's strength of character. They tell you the truth, but they stand by you. The Apostle Paul uses terms related to strength of character, stability of mind. Standing firm in truth. What have we talked about and what have you learned about lately with balance and stability? 
You cannot have stability of mind and have terms like foundation and grounded and rooted and stability and balance if you're all over the place with your emotions. The Apostle Paul uses terms related to strength of character, stability of mind, and standing firm in truth. Rizzato, the word you're looking at there, points to a firm foundation which is not easily shaken. It's rooted. It actually goes to a definition of a tree or something, a strong tree, where the roots go three or four feet into the ground. And the other one, Thelimato, again, pointing to strength and foundation, but it means to stand erect, to stand strong. To stand erect or stand strong. All of these speak, speaks to strength and stability, which means your mind, which means your soul. Again, the heart. Not the cardiovascular heart pumping blood. The heart, the mind, the soul is filled with applicable knowledge. Applicable knowledge. Because emotions cannot be applied. What do you apply with emotions? Happiness, joy, I felt good. That, that message made me feel good. I felt the spirit in the room. How are you going to apply that five days later when the you-know-what hits the fan? Applicable knowledge. Deep in. We understand the protocol... As believer priests, we approach prayer through the spiritual channel of our union with Christ, the high priest. As a royal priest, understand your union with Christ is a channel there, direct pipeline. You're in union with Christ. Your position is secured. John 14, 13, and whatever you ask, Jesus speaking, whatever you ask in my name, how do you finish the prayer? What are you calling to God when you go to God the Father in the Spirit? you sealing it with Jesus' name, Jesus' merits, His work, the person and work of Christ. You ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There is a protocol. Verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Ephesians 6, 18 then says what? With every prayer and request, the Apostle Paul writes, pray at all times in the Spirit. Right thing in the right way, believer priest. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance. Every request for what? All the saints, not self first. All the saints. You pray for others, that's your priority list. Stop making your prayer. Listen, I'm not telling you, you don't have your prayers throughout the day and the quick, even the quick two or three minute prayers where something's going on and you're saying, God, guide me or lead me. Of course, that's for you. I understand that. But the bulk of your prayers, when you're sitting and really focused on your prayer life, you have people in situations you're praying for that are outside of, God, I need this. Give me that. There's signs and symbols of maturity, and one of them is you're not always praying for, God, get me out of this jam. God, give me this. Those are signs and symbols in your prayer life that you're not maturing. The spiritual power of the believer's approach is the filling power of the Holy Spirit. The spiritual power of the believer, because we can do nothing in our flesh, so the spiritual power of the believer's approach is the filling power of the Holy Spirit. That has to be opened up, your Christ-like nature. That is the formula, that is the standard, believer priest. Human intellect and human power will only interfere with your spiritual walk. It is completely incapable of spiritual power. Human intellect, human power is completely incapable of spiritual power. So I hate to tell you... <sighs> That when you go to a church or you go to a, a building and a bunch of people are there praying or chanting or whatever they're doing and you're saying, I feel the Spirit on me, be careful with that. I'm not saying that I don't put God in a box. I'm not saying that God the Holy Spirit does not fill up a room full of positive believers. Yes, but I would say for the most part, it is not this emotional wave, this emotional response, I feel this... I feel the spirit in this moment, and that's how you walk. And you're walking in your emotions. Be very careful of walking in your emotions. Be filled with the spirit. Three categories, believe a priest. Three categories of Christian prayer you should know. Should be something all believer priests that are maturing understand. One, 
is the high priest. I think we've covered that. Most of you know this is Jesus Christ. One and only, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His prayer life on our behalf, Hebrews 7.25, we actually covered, I showed you. He's working on our behalf always. Our union with him is powerful. Rest in that, Salah, rest in your union with Christ. Find some faith, rest in that as well. Number two, falls under the emergency prayer. And yes, most believers use this. God the Holy Spirit does the emergency prayer. Romans 8, 26 and 27, which I'm going to put on the board because a lot of people, when they have a series like this, and I, and I warn against not using prayer as a problem-solving device or crying out all the time for help, I'm very serious about that. But there is emergency prayer. I don't want to teach you there's not, because obviously you can see it in Scripture, but it is not what God expects of us. God expects us to fall in love with Him have a relationship, intimacy with the Trinity at such a level that we mature and we become leaders and problem solvers. It's not always God help. I'm in a jam again. Oh, well, help me out. But there is emergency prayer. Romans 8, 26, 27. I'll put them on the board. Romans 8, 26. Now in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. Yes, we are. For we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, Romans 8, 27. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You have God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ working in your favor in relation to prayer, in relation to guidance. We need to relax in that. God established a plan. God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ will lead us through that plan if we're in tune to them. But yes, in our weakness, we are weak. And many times we get in, in a jam and we don't understand what's going on. And we have to look to God and say, what's happening here, Lord? And God, the Holy Spirit, when we're filled and applying his word, starts to show us and guide us. Notice everything is related to God's plan from eternity past. The divine decree, God's plan from eternity past. We know God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ intercedes for us, but ultimately God the Father has enabled each believer priest the power and grace to become a prayer warrior themselves. That's the point I'm getting to. Listen to me carefully. We know God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ intercedes for us, it's like having a millionaire father or something like that, a very wealthy father. you got to get to a point where you want to be respected as an adult man or woman and stand on your own two feet, where you don't keep getting in jams and say, oh, daddy will get me out of it. That's not maturity. We know God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ intercedes for us, but ultimately God the Father has enabled each believer, believer priest, our office of priesthood, the power and grace to become a prayer warrior ourselves. We're able to stand strong. Right now in the temporal is what I'm talking about. Number three in the categories of prayer. The third category is the prayer from the believer priest. Maturity. As a mature prayer warrior who's able to stand strong inside the plan of God, that's what you want to strive for. Are you going to fumble along the way? Yes, we're all weak. We're all flawed creatures. There's a cosmic system set against us. God understands all of that. He gives us an out all along the way. Yes, you can use the emergency prayer. Yes, you can call to God if you have to get into a jam. But ultimately, this third category is what you're driving for. Maturity. As a mature believer, you're a prayer warrior. You want that title of being a prayer warrior who's able to stand strong inside the plan of God. Hebrews 4.16. We covered this, I think, last lesson. How are you going to approach the throne of God when you speak? Always in tears and always, help, help me, help me, I screwed up again. I need a, I can't get out of this jam. I don't have enough doctrine. That's what you're saying every time. Or would you rather be a Hebrews 4.16 believer priest? Therefore, believer priest, Let's approach the throne room of grace with confidence. Not arrogance, confidence. Strong. So that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. 
Show me the way, God. Do you want me to stand in this problem? Is there a solution that I haven't seen? You show me. I want to know which doctrine you want me to use. You guide me and show me. I'm going to stand strong here. I'm not going to cry out. I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to stand strong and you show me. I'm approaching your throne in confidence because I know you've resolved everything in eternity past. The divine decree took into account of all prayer in time and incorporated the answers before history began. So relax, catch your breath, be confident, step back, get your balance, all these things we've talked about, apply the faith rest and the promises, and stand and see what God has for you. The divine decree took into account all prayer in time and incorporated the answers before history began. Before there was any human history, all of the prayers that would ever be uttered, all of us, in human history, were known to God through his omniscience. All knowledge. As a part of the divine decrees, they were incorporated into history long before history even began. Long before history began. It's taken care of. So if it's taken care of, relax in that. Catch your breath. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. There will be either a growth spurt going on that you need to stand in, or there will be an avenue God will show you. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me, he says, and I will answer. Call to me, I'll answer you, believer. I will tell you great and mighty things if you're ready for them, believer, priest, mature enough, which you do not know. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you already, eternity past, declares the Lord. Plans for prosperity, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Keep that in mind as you pray, as you stand strong, as you get your balance. I know the plans I have for you from eternity past, declares the Lord. Plans for prosperity, not disaster. To give you a future and a hope. Prayer effectiveness reaches its peak, its zenith, at the time of maturity, especially those living like a super grace lifestyle, somebody like Abraham towards the end of his life, Job, David, different men we can look at, even the Apostle Paul and even Peter, they hit levels of super grace life. Prayer effectiveness was in their life. The design for prayer was not to live in immaturity, relying upon the emergency prayer at every turn. It's there. Isn't it nice to know it's there? But just because it's there doesn't mean you're supposed to use it all the time. That's the shortcut. That's being lazy. In fact, those type of emergency prayers should be far and few as we grow into spiritual maturity. Emergency prayers. Help get me out of this, Father. Should be far and few as we grow towards spiritual maturity. As the believer holds the high ground in the spiritual life, they'll become a prayer warrior. How will I know? Because you're going to see effective prayer in your life. Your prayer is going to align with the will of God, the plan of God. And because you're maturing, there's prayers in your life. Not everyone, but many, will come to fruition in some form or fashion a little quicker than they did a few years ago. Amen? That is what the plan of God calls for. That's how you glorify God. Private prayer, we've talked about this a few times, becomes one of the significant and most powerful callings for all believers. Your private prayer life. Organization is one thing that is absolutely necessary in effective prayer life. You have to have an organized, balanced, consistent life believer to be in the office of a believer priest and really apply these things. Your life needs to be organized. Four principles in proper order and fashion are the call for the prayer. Four principles in proper order, right thing in the right way, in fashion, are the call for the prayers. This, um, remember, this lesson is highlighting a believer priest in their office at a mature level moving forward. That's what you should be striving for. Confession of sin, first and foremost. Many of you know this. 1 John 1.9. Also, 1 Corinthians 11.31, right there on the board. But if we judge, 
ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. I could probably give you a half a dozen other uh, scriptures showing the fact that we have to wash the sin from our life. Confession of sin is the first function of private prayer. All of our prayers, make sure you're washing, naming, inciting any known sin, filling the power of the Spirit. 1 John 1, 9, along with many scriptures, like 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one 31 on the board, tells us to name and cite any known sins. How about put on the, the new, take off the old, walk in love, walk in Christ, put on Christ. How about all those? They're all the same. Put on the new, take off the old sin nature. Nothing is accomplished without the new nature in control. Nothing is accomplished without the new nature in control. Now listen, if you're driving in your car, because you always get the crazy questions. You're a mature believer. You're driving in your car. Somebody hits your car and it hang, it's hanging off a cliff. At that moment, you say, God help. You don't have to hang there on the cliff with your car ready to roll over on top of you and say, let me name and cite any known sins. That's a good emergency prayer right there. Father help. <laughs> he knows. He sees it. Do you understand what I'm saying? To put on the new nature, take off the old sin nature, these are all protocols in your office of priesthood. Nothing is accomplished without the new nature in control. Obviously, an emergency is an emergency. You all know that. I think I explained that. Because you'd be surprised the questions you get about prayer. Number two, thanksgiving. This is an attitude, a spirit in you. A grateful spirit. Thanksgiving. Ephesians 5.2 Always giving thanks for all things believer priests. Always giving thanks for all things in the name. There it is. How do you seal that prayer? How does that prayer have the power and the seal of it? Of our Lord Jesus Christ to God our Father. Right there. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us almost the same thing. Thanksgiving displays grace orientation. You can tell a grace-oriented believer they have a grateful spirit. They're not petty. They're not caught up in lack of forgiveness, any of these kind of things. They have grace in their life. The grace They give themselves grace. They give other people grace. They understand the grace plan of God, which we covered recently. Thanksgiving displays grace orientation. It recognizes the source of all blessings. Do you recognize the source of of all blessings in your prayer life, habitually, believer priest. Thanksgiving displays grace orientation. Gratitude and a spirit of thanksgiving comes naturally as we grow. It's part of the fruit of the spirit, really, having that type of nature come out of you. It should be reflected in our prayer life. Your prayer life should re reflect a spirit of grace orientation, thanksgiving and gratitude. Not pettiness and anger and frustration at every turn. Number three, intercessory. Intercession for others. You could use, a, you know, this petition and intercession as different definitions. But intercession is really praying for others, one of the, the main definitions. You want to intercede. What did we do with uh, Jason's surgery and Shelby and some other people recently, we're trying to intercede. We're not trying to put our flesh in there, but we're just trying to say, Father, can you put your hand on this situation and help it go in the right direction? Praying for others. Part of your prayer life. Part of your office. Believe a priesthood right there. Ephesians 6.18, the Apostle Paul writes with every prayer and request. Pray at all times in the spirit, proper protocol, and with this in view, be alert with all perseverance, every request for all the saints. Be alert, perseverance. What's that talking about? Having your mind right. You're not an emotional wreck. When you're alert, you can see what's going on around you. You see there's others around you that maybe even haven't asked for prayer or situations going on around you in the world that you need to pray for. You're alert. You have your balance, your stability, and all perseverance speaks to endurance. Every request for all the saints. Keep everybody in prayer. If you're involved in a little congregation like this, we should all be part of your prayers. You could say, you know, a little PRB ministry congregation, my Bible study congregation. Let them go forward. Put your hand on them, Father. That should be regularly in your prayers. And when we bring up names like that, do what I told you to do before. 
Take the next week or the next several days and make sure you focus on those people in your prayers. Praying for others above self is a sign of maturity. You might want to underline that. Praying for others above self is a sign of maturity, and it falls under proper protocol for prayer. Your office of believer priest is what I'm talking about. As you mature, these just become natural. The right thing done in the right way. You have a spirit and an attitude of all of these type of things we're covering here. Praying for others above self. The more you grow in God's grace and knowledge, the more you're consistent Prayer will hold true to these four standards I'm showing you. The more you grow in God's grace and knowledge, the more your consistent prayer, your office of priesthood, prayer life, will hold true to these four standards, which in turn means your prayers will become more effective. Because that's a question. How can it become more effective? You see these steps I'm showing you? You see this series on prayer? Have you studied it and really took a good look at it and then compared your life, not to be feeling guilty, but just compared your office of priesthood with what I'm showing you? Number four, petition. Notice it's the last because when you start talking about petition, you're usually talking about for yourself or your situations around you, your intimate ones. Petition, the request for what unfolds within our personal life very close to us, around us. That's how it's used. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, the Apostle Paul writes, because I sat face to face with Lord in the third heavenly classroom, being taught mystery doctrine, to keep me from exalting myself, because I was already a genius <laughs> in the Torah, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Many people believe Paul could have struggled with a little arrogance or pride from time to time. 2 Corinthians 12, 8. Concerning this, I petitioned. Concerning this, because it was a struggle for me, he admits it. Concerning this, I pleaded, I petitioned with the Lord three times in prayer that it might leave me. And God said, okay, oh, that's your emergency cry. I'll take you. He said, no, 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 Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, which means sit right where you're at, Paul. Accept this situation that you're in and learn to grow and go forward in it. My grace is sufficient for you. There are several reasons why prayer is not answered. I covered a few. I'm going to go over and highlight these as we close today. Sometimes it's a simple matter of God telling us to wait. People don't like to hear these two. Why didn't a prayer get answered? Maybe it's God saying, wait. Or maybe he is saying no. God doesn't say yes to every prayer. I'm not teaching you that. Some other pulpits might teach you that. God doesn't say yes to every prayer. So sometimes it's a simple matter that prayer is not answered because God's saying, wait. My grace is sufficient for you. Or... No. In relation to what we're praying for, he might be saying, no, I don't know. When you were a little kid, did your parents give you everything you wanted? You know, when I was little, about eight or nine years old, I fell in love with King Kong for some reason. I saw the King Kong. Movie. All I wanted, my mother told me I did it three Christmases in a row. All I wanted, I didn't want a monkey. I wanted a gorilla. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. She'll tell you I was little. We're talking, you know, six, seven, eight years old. There was three years in a row where that's all I kept telling her. So they started buying me the King Kong doll or whatever they could do to get me. But I said, no, I want a real gorilla for Christmas. Of course, my dad had, you know, with a beer and a cigarette in his hand. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'll give you a gorilla, all right. <laughs> but that's what I prayed for. I was told no. Would have killed me. When the believer refuses to stay in tune to God's word in their new nature, they often cannot discern from God telling them to wait or God telling them no. Isn't it nice to admit that in the eyes of God, I don't care if you're 50 years old, 25 years old, 70 years old, that we're still kind of little kids. We're little spoiled teens with our Father God. We all are. 
When the believer refuses to stay in tune to God's word and their new nature, they often cannot discern from God telling them to wait or God telling them no. And therefore, they get frustrated. God speaks to us through his word. Not I feel the spirit in the room because the music was playing loud. Or the pastor told me something that made me feel good. God speaks to us through his word accurately. In the new nature, therefore, Bible study, prayer, remaining spiritually balanced to what's going on around us is a key to our discernment. There's an old story I'm going to tell you. Many of you know it, but I think it's, it applies to this today, especially closing out prayer and the question sometimes pastors get asked about, how come this prayer wasn't answered? How come God did this way and I prayed about this or that? Let's read this slide one more time before I tell you the old story you all know. But the story is wonderful to teach and use. It's a great teaching tool for prayer. When the believer refuses to stay in tune to God's word in their new nature, they often cannot discern from God telling them to wait or God telling them no. God speaks to us through his word in the new nature. Got to be in the new nature, his word. Two power options. Therefore, Bible study, what you're doing right now, prayer, your prayer life, remaining spiritually balanced day in and day out keeping your wits about you, being filled with the Spirit, paying attention to things around you, what's going on is a key to our discernment. The old story of the Christian who heard the news of the flood coming, their neighbor maybe told them, and they said, it's okay. I'll stay here in my house. God's going to save me. I'm a mature enough believer. I know that I heard about the flood. The next day, the sheriff shows up and says, hey, <laughs> you should evacuate because there's probably a flood coming. Looks like it's heading this way. No, 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 I'll stay. God will take care of me. Then the news starts to show news flash every hour giving warnings as the streets start to fill up with water near your house. Yet the Christian says, oh, no, no, no. I'll wait for God to save me. Then because the flood hits, they have to climb on the roof as the house is flooded below them. And a rescue boat comes up. It says, jump in. They say, no, no, no. I'm not going to jump in. God will take care of me. Okay. Then as the water is reaching up to the roof, they're hanging out to the chimney, a helicopter flies over. Rescue helicopter. And yet the Christian ignores the ladder that the helicopter drops down and says, no, 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 God will take care of me. Finally, you know the story, the Christian drowned to death. When they get to heaven, they ask God, why didn't you answer my prayers? He said, I did. Repeatedly. I sent your neighbors, I sent the news, I sent the sheriff. I made sure that unbeliever down the street that you didn't like with the boat came by and offered you a ride. I had a helicopter swing by. You rejected the call. You rejected every opening I gave you. It didn't fit what you wanted. Think about that story. I know it's goofy and a lot of people have used it. It's really great related to prayers and what we want and how we want them to unfold. Be careful how you put your flesh and your viewpoint in how you want your prayers to unfold. Let us close with reasons for unanswered prayers. Carnality, reversionism, going backward instead of forward for long periods of time really is failure to adjust to the justice of God. Failure to be in control by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 6.18. You're just not naming and citing sins. You're just ignoring your Bible study. You're ignoring walking in the new nature. You're ignoring the filling power. All of these different things you're starting to ignore. You're going backward instead of forward habitually in the plan of God. Prayer can't get answered. Mental attitude sins, especially when you're caught in chain sinning. Bitterness, jealousy, anger, uh, doubt, worry, fear, anxiety, chain sinning. Mental attitude sins. Psalms 66, 18. I've given you some of these scriptures already, but these will answer why some prayers aren't, aren't 
coming to fruition in your life, believer. You can't be a, a, a believer priest and be walking in these problem areas here and expect to be an effective prayer warrior. The sin of pride. Walking in self-righteous state of mind. Big problem. Job 35, 12, and 13 covers that. I don't think I gave you that scripture. But that's a good one to look at. Job 35, 12, uh, 13. The Christian, actually, who drowned on the rooftop story falls under that category. They seem like a nice Christian, but really underneath it all, they kind of, I know God's going to take care of me. I know. I got, I got, he's going to do it my way. He's just miraculously going to lift me up. They refuse to look outside of what they think God will do or how God will come through for them. And maybe it was an unbeliever in a boat, like I said, that came by there like, that can't be God. Really? Be careful. Putting God in a box. A believer trapped in lust patterns, which shows selfishness. Big problem. James 4, 2 through 4. Prayers will not be answered. You're a selfish type of person, and you have lust patterns taking control. Failure of faith rest drill, applying what God keeps showing you, which is really failure to grow in faith. Mark eleven twenty four. Your prayers will not be answered. Failure in the faith avenue, Mark eleven twenty four will not be answered, your prayers. Lack of obedience to recognize God's love and calling for us. You're not that obedient to the plan of God. You don't want to recognize your love and intimate call for you to be with God. You kind of kick against that. 1 John 3, 1 through 2. 1 John 3, 1 through 2. Lack of obedience to recognize God's love, intimacy, and call to us insubordination bucking the authority of the plan of God insubordination to the will of God first John 5 14 through 19 I'm just giving you basic scriptures to back up what I'm showing you these are reasons prayers aren't answered and we have to be honest with ourselves in our office of believer priesthood are we somebody trapped in lust patterns do we really fit do we really succeed in the area of Faith rests and growing. Can we look back and say, geez, in the last three years, my faith has grown, even if it's just a little bit, a little more than it was. If not, maybe your prayers aren't being answered. Lack of obedience for the call to intimacy with God. Insubordination to the plan of God. If you refuse to make yourself available to God and you keep kicking against his plan, your prayer life I can guarantee is going to be hindered. It's a guarantee. You refuse to make yourself available to God and you keep kicking against his plan, your prayer life will be hindered. If you're a believer whose prayer life still revolves around what you want and how you want it, and emergency prayers are your main petition, after you've been born again and saved for a few years, I'm here to warn you, God will not keep indulging in that laziness. Let me say that one again. If you are a believer whose prayer life still revolves around what you want, and emergency prayers are your main petition all the time, after you've been born again and saved for a few years, I'm here to warn you, God will not keep indulging in that laziness. He's eventually going to step back and say, no. You need to grow up, which any good parent does. You step back. Helicopter parents we have today that do everything, try to keep a kid in a bubble. You're not doing that kid any favors. It's good to step back. Let them lose. Let them fall. Let them learn a lesson after you've tried to teach them. That's good parenting. Lack of obedience. Here's another one in the realm of marriage. 1 Peter 3, 7 gives an example, but it goes both ways, ladies and men. 1 Peter 3, 7 talks to the men, but I'll tell you, ladies and men, lack of obedience in what God has laid down in Christian marriage. Lack of grace orientation, those with a hard heart, they don't like to operate in grace. They may give themselves some grace, they don't give others grace. Hard-hearted. Proverbs 21, 13. These are all reasons, folks. That prayers aren't answered. These are all reasons that prayers aren't answered. And we need to look at our own lives. Don't look at your husband. Don't look at your wife. Don't look at your kid. Don't look at your neighbor. 
Look at yourself. Take an inventory of yourself. Don't be a fruit inspector for somebody else. When we refuse to grow after years of God calling us and trying to get our attention, we bring in our own self-induced misery. And part of that is your prayers fall flat on the floor. So if you're, you're in some form of reaping what you sow because of years or a long period of time or rejecting God or these different things I'm showing you, you start bringing in self-induced misery. Part of self-induced misery is that your prayers bounce around the room when you pray and they end up flat on the floor. These are all good things to look at in your prayer life. Hopefully they answered a lot of the questions. I think we're going to move forward in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. We're in next lesson. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.